All right, so um, today we're going to review pulp therapy as well as the primary molar pulpotomy. Whenever you see a large carious lesion, be that clinically or radiographically, you want to make sure that you always, always take a bi-wing if you saw it clinically, as well as take a PA. Any sign of a large carious lesion needs to be investigated for pulpal pathology. So we always, always take a bite wing as well as a PA. This means when you're seeing a patient in the clinic and we ask you to take a look first and do your exam and decide what kind of x-rays you want to take, you were hoping that you decide whether you need bite wings as well as some PAs. When you take a bite wing and accompany that with a PA, you'll be surprised what you find. For example, here we see a large carious lesion on the distal of tooth number S accompanied by a furcation radiolucency as well as loss of lamina dura, some loss of trabeculation, and some um, external root resorption of the distal root. So again, make sure if you see a large carious lesion, you go ahead and take a PA as well as a bite wing. The next steps in diagnosing pulp diagnosis is to characterize the pain. So is the pain spontaneous, lingering, or provoked? But remember, you're talking to a child patient. So you may ask them if the tooth has ever bothered them while they're at school. Has it ever bothered them while they're trying to go to sleep? Those may be indications of spontaneous pain. Of course, you can ask them if the pain stays around for a while. So if they have ice cream, does it bother them and it hurts for a while after that? Or is it a pretty quick discomfort? So remember, you are talking to a kid, so try to use the language that a kid would understand. After you've taken a bite wing and a PA, as well as characterized the pain, your next step is to perform your pulp testing. You're going to check for palpation and percussion sensitivity. Checking for palpation, you use your finger and just palpate and push along the, bu the buckle as well as the lingual bone of any tooth in question. Percussion, as you know, I like to use a mirror handle. So I tap on the tooth next door, such as the canine, like tooth number R in this case, and I say, I'm going to see if anybody's home. Tap, tap, tap. Anybody home there? Whatever the child says is normal. If they say no, then you know that no is a normal tooth. If they say yes, then that's a normal tooth. When I go to tooth number T, which in this x-ray looks healthy, I'm going to tap on the tooth and say, is anybody home there? It should be the same response as R. So if nobody's home, then both of those teeth are healthy. Next, I'm going to tap on tooth number S and say, is anybody home? And I'm looking for changes in the eyes, changes in the facial expression, as well as changes in the response to tell me if there's sensitivity to percussion. The last thing that you're going to do is check for mobility. So again, checking R, S, and T, you're going to use your finger and the mirror handle to try to move the tooth. If you see mobility, you know that um, as long as the tooth is not about to exfoliate and you see mobility, um, you know that the tooth has some swelling as well as um, maybe some bone loss that has caused the PDL and the bone to enlarge and the bone to be lost and then now increase mobility. If you have sensitivity to percussion, it's more likely that the PDL is inflamed, again, a sign of irreversible pulpitis. If you have sensitivity to palpation, that would also be a sign of irreversible pulpitis or perhaps necrosis. Again, positive palpation, percussion, or mobility beyond physiologic would be indications of irreversible pulpitis or necrosis. As well, spontaneous lingering pain would be indications of irreversible pulpitis or necrosis. And our provoked pain that goes away right away is a good sign. That means we're in the, we're in the reversible pulpitis stage. Okay, so you've taken your bite wing and your PA. Just a reminder, in your PA, you're looking for lamina dura to be intact, PDL to be intact. You're looking for good trabeculation interradriculary and any loss of bone. If you don't see any loss of bone and a nice PDL, then you should feel comfortable that the radiographic signs are normal. This is also an excellent um, example of decay that's close to the pulp, but there's a dentin bridge between the decay and the pulp. Those are really good signs for a vital healthy pulp. Our pulp therapy options, just to review, are protective base or liner, indirect pulp therapy, direct pulp capping, and pulpotomy. All four of these are vital pulp therapies. As we know, we're not doing direct pulp capping for any um, primary teeth because they do tend to fail um, due to internal root resorption. We tend to use indirect pulp therapy, a protective base, or a pulpotomy pretty commonly in the primary dentition. But again, remember, the teeth have to be vital for this to work. A reminder, we're going to talk a little bit about pulpotomy. What is it? Well, the coronal pulp is amputated, 
but the radicular pulp, that which is within the roots, is treated with a medicament, such as formocresol, ferric sulfate, or MTA. And I love this photo because it shows you indirect pulp therapy, where you've left decay behind directly over the pulp, but have a clean DEJ, versus a pulpotomy. You can see here a crown has already been started, the occlusal reduction has been completed, the, the pulp chamber has been opened, and we see a vital pulp bleeding. So at this point, we're gonna amputate the rest of the pulp and achieve hemostasis. So just a reminder and a question for you, if the indications are the same for both, an indirect pulp therapy or a pulpotomy, why would we ever perform a pulpotomy? Well, a good indication is a carious or iatrogenic pulp exposure. So for example, let's say that you're treating a tooth that you've determined to be vital and reversibly inflamed. You took a bite wing and a PA, of course, you checked for um, signs and symptoms, the patient is asymptomatic. You checked palpation, percussion, and mobility, and all were negative. They have no history, um, they have no radiographic findings, and no interradricular radiolucency. You plan for indirect pulp therapy, but unfortunately you did not leave that last bit of decay. Instead, the pulp was slightly opened by your removal of caries. This is a great indication for pulpotomy. It's a carious or iatrogenic, in this case carious, pulp exposure. Once we expose the pulp, then we're looking for pus at the exposure site. That would be a bad sign. We're looking for bright red blood, as well as the ability to achieve hemostasis. Hemostasis is an important part of the procedure and an important part of the diagnosis. If we're not able to achieve hemostasis within five minutes or with easy pressure with a cotton pellet, then the tooth is not likely to be reversibly inflamed. Instead, it's probably hyperemic, meaning too much inflammation in the area. So when we have a carious or iatrogenic pulp exposure, that's a great indication for pulpotomy if the tooth is reversibly inflamed with no other signs or symptoms and no radiographic findings. So let's go ahead and watch the pulpotomy procedure. As you see here, the tooth has already um, had um, occlusal reduction because they're getting ready for a crown. Now they're using, um, on slow speed, a size, probably a size eight round burr to remove the occlusal decay. Remember, we do occlusal reduction first, followed by caries removal, because we don't wanna slice interproximally and have a lot of bleeding. Um, we don't wanna jump right to the entire crown prep before um, removing all of the decay and completing pulp therapy. So let's watch closely as they remove the decay on slow speed. If you watch close enough, you will see that pulp last bit of pulp exposure. They were trying to do IPT, but they got a little bit too close. The pulp that's exposed, you can see, is slightly exposed on the, um, it looks like the distal bust buckle pulp horn. In just a second, it will be exposed. Again, still losing, using slow speed and a very large round burr such as an eight or six. And it looks like we are nearing pulp exposure at this point. Once you do expose one of the pulp horns, you're gonna to continue to remove the remainder of the decay and then um, find the rest of the pulp horns and go ahead and connect them. Here we're still doing some more caries removal. We've located a, the a palatal pulp horn as well as the distal buckle pulp horn. We switch now to a sterile 330 burr in order to complete our access cavity. The operator here has moved from the distal buckle to the mesial buckle pulp horn with their 330 burr and is now connecting it to the palate. So we have a nice triangular shape, shaped access cavity and you'll see here they're going to um, remove the roof of the pulp chamber. Up oh, there is the roof of the pulp chamber. So now we are in the coronal pulp. There we go, roof of the pulp chamber. Okay, at this point, they're gonna continue with their access cavity, and you see that you have a nice red um, bleeding vital pulp. Next step is a clean eight carbide round burr on slow speed. We're using that burr to pull up within the access cavity, not to drill down. 
by pulling up in the access cavity, you're getting rid of any ledges and just slowly opening up the access cavity while removing some of the coronal pulp. Again, drawing up and up and up with the burr, not pushing down. At this point, you use a nice clean spoon excavator to remove some of the um, remaining radicular pulp. You're going into each of the three pulp um, canals, but just to um, the floor of the pulp chamber, you're not going into the canals themselves. At this point, I usually like to get a cotton pellet and sort of stick the cotton pellet inside the canals in order to um, get better visualization. Here, removing additional coronal pulp, and then we're gonna be doing some cotton pellets in order to um, better visualize the pulp tissue. Removing some additional pulp here, and then applying our um, achieving hemostasis. After achieving hemostasis, our next step is to apply the um, medicament. In this case, they are using a five minute formal cresol application. So here again, additional coronal pulp removal. And there is our medicament. Not too wet, just a little bit of formal cresol on the pellet. You can see it's a bit moist and then a dry cotton pellet on top. After the pellet is removed, you wanna re-verify hemostasis and then restore the coronal pulp with IRM, followed by a stainless steel crown preparation. So that's your 10 minute review of pediatric dentistry. You can go to Angel to complete your assessment.